Hi everyone, and greetings from day one of DevLearn 2015. Uh, I'm doing my usual little recap videos, and so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how the first day went. So we started out with a keynote from David Pogue. He talked about a session called Learning Disrupted, the Unrecognizable New World of Tech and Culture. And so he showed us a lot of examples of um, how we're surrounded by devices that can do an absurd amount of new cool things. Um, and they can do serious things like track our health, or silly things, like he showed an app that created a digital ocarina that you could play on your phone by blowing into the microphone. So, serious things and silly things. Um, so these things don't just make our lives better, although in the case of the ocarina, I'm not better. Um, but they also change how, what, and why we create, share, and interact. It's also changing how we act and are as a culture. Um, he also talked about how these new devices are discovered. And he basically said, look, you never know what's going to be a hit. And the vast majority of new innovations are going to fail, possibly fail miserably. Uh, but we have to have to keep do to, to keep innovating is to keep trying things out and, you know, see what sticks, see what doesn't, and then just, you know, keep going with that. That um, innovation doesn't come from just magically getting things right right away, which is always a good message to hear. So uh, next up, I started going to concurrent sessions. And the first one I went to was do-it-yourself music tracks, loops, and virtual information by Don Bolin. And so uh, he talked about why you'd want to add a soundtrack to your learning. You know, soundtracks convey um, mood, emotions, um, transitions, give things a sense of place. And so all of this can make the things that you create more immersive. So, you know, e-learning videos, what have you. Um, if you're not a musician, though, what you can do is leverage a loop. So these are little tiny snippets of uh, music and you know, repeat them after each other, or use a whole bunch of different loops and interweave them together to create your own soundtracks yourself, which is great and awesome. Uh, the main tool that he showed off for this was GarageBand. So if you're an Apple user, hey, you're in luck. I mean, are obviously Windows good ones, but he uh, particularly liked GarageBand because one comes free with your Mac. Um, so cheap, it's easy to learn how to use, and comes pre-installed with a whole bunch of loops. You can get started right away. Uh, he mentioned a few other free and cheap places to get loops. So um, a few he mentioned were Big Fish Audio, Sound Nation, um, CC Mixter, and freesound.org. Uh, there's a few things I was thinking about as he was doing this talk about apps that you can get for your devices that help you make your own loops. Um, once again, even if you're not a musician. So there's a few that I've been playing with lately that I really like um, that are all either really cheap or free. So the three that I've been liking are Oxy, A-U-X-Y, uh, Beatwave, and then uh, this one's Amazing Figure by Propellerhead. I think they just made it free, so go check that one out. Um, all three of these are ways that you can create your own loops yourself and then use something like GarageBand to weave it all together into a soundtrack. Uh, the next session I went to was one of the learning stages and it was We Don't Own Social in the Workplace and We Never Will by J.D. Uh, Dillon. Uh, J.D. and I used to always have our sessions scheduled at the exact same time, so I'm only finally starting to get to see him do presentations now after years of knowing him. Um, great presenter. I think he's now on my list of people I like. will always just go, that's a sure thing. Um, he kind of advertised this as a rant, but it wasn't really a rant. But obviously, you can tell by the title, he's um, not totally buying into this whole idea that L&D should be leading the charge on social. And not that he doesn't believe in social, but maybe not how we're doing it right now. So he talked about how a lot of companies have social technology, sometimes even more than one tool, but many co companies find that they have trouble getting people to actually use the darn things. Um, you know, just because you get a tool doesn't mean people care that you got the tool. Um, some companies think that this is a lack of skill, so people just don't know how to use the tool. But a lot of these social tools are like the social media tools that we're using elsewhere, like Facebook and Twitter and what have you. They're incredibly easy to use, and people actually use these kind of tools all the time. So the problem isn't lack of knowledge, it's lack of interest or lack of understanding how that tool fits into making their work life better. It's a lot of the way that we use social for other areas. It isn't immediately um, apparent to people how you would use social in a work circumstance. It's so sometimes divorced from how we use social elsewhere. So what are some things that you can do to help people understand how social tools can fit into their work life and make their work easier? 
Well, a few that Jay mentioned were um, just like letting people know how the tool actually practically helps you do your work. And you can do this by modeling, you know, setting up projects and showing people directly and you know, helping them catch on. Um, another thing he mentioned was uh, a natural application is to have people uh, solve problems socially. So use your social tool, put out a problem, and have them solve the problem in the tool. And so that's a great way to get people to wrap their heads around, well, how could I use this tool? Um, he also mentioned being needing to be agile with your tools, not like get rid of your tool every three seconds, but um, as a lot of us are aware, social tools come out of nowhere, or social media tools come out of nowhere, uh, rise in popularity incredibly quickly sometimes, and, you know, sometimes fall by the wayside, as any of us who ever had a MySpace account know. Um, and, you know, you're not going to be able to do that in your workplace but be aware that you are going to have to start paying attention to those trends and see how you can integrate them into what you're doing. Not just, you know, be like, we bought a social tool two years ago and we never have to change anything again. Uh, something he felt really passionately about, at least it seemed from the talk, was that uh, learning and development shouldn't lead the charge on social. You actually want the whole organization involved. But uh, learning and development should have a seat at the table and be part of that. Um, Something that learning and development is in a unique position to do, though, and it's a way that you can help your organization with social, is by trying out new tools, kind of giving them a kick at the tires, um, finding the ones that are cool, and finding out how they could work for work, and then just like sharing that information with people. So um, JD told us a really interesting story about leveraging Slack, where he works, and he just got his team into it helped them see how they could use it to help their team work, and then started like, just letting other people in the organization in on it, saying, hey, this is a cool thing we learned, we, we figured it out, love to let you see what we're doing too, and that actually helped it catch on. I kind of like this idea of like little tiny pilots to try things out and like build up why someone would care. Um, and I would say if you're looking at trying to make your social platform or what have you um, at your workplace, actually engaging. JD someone who's really good to talk to. Uh, after that, I was actually on a panel called Past, Present, and Future of Games. It was with Julie Dirksen, Sharon Bowler, and Kareem Pagano. Um, really interesting panel, lots of really great questions from the audience that I'm not even going to try and summarize here. Um, the I will say one thing though, and there was the final question that was asked, which was a kind of a two-parter. Um, the first question that was, asked, what's our favorite game right now? And I, if you know me, you know I love, 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 love video games. I have, like, I think, I feel like my whole life, practically. Uh, something that I'm really into right now is incredibly dorky. It's uh, a type of video game called a uh, uh, visual novel. It's a really popular format in Japan. It's all about storytelling and choice in storytelling and having that influence a game. And because I'm really big on choice and breaking scenarios and stuff like that, it's kind of a natural fit for the stuff I'm interested in. So... There's a particular visual novel that I'm pretty keen on right now. It's totally dorky. It's called Hatoful Boyfriend. It is a spoof of Japanese dating simulation games. In this case, it riffs on all the tropes from these games, but your love interests are all pigeons and other kinds of birds. It's very silly, very self-aware. Um, it does a really great job of showing how making different choices can completely change a game. Um, and then the other game, we were, our thing we were asked was, what's a game we would recommend other people play? And I kind of went somewhere a little different with the question. I actually recommend, rather than playing a specific game, is that people go out and go to Kickstarter, which is a crowdfunding platform, and kickstart at least one game. I don't care what game you kickstart, it doesn't matter. The cool thing is, is that games on Kickstarter typically haven't been fully developed or developed at all yet. They're usually proof of concepts so at the point they go to Kickstarter. And so you keep getting development updates about how the game is produced. And I think if you want to create a game for learning, you really have to understand how games just in general are uh, created. And this is an amazing way to do that, get insights from the game developers, find out what's working, what's not, what the process was, where they kind of backslid. And you get that all from the production notes from um, the games that you kickstart, at least I have for every game I've kickstarted. And like, you don't even have to kickstart the whole game, just like give them a buck, that usually gets you access to the updates, and it's an amazing wealth of information. Finally, we had the final keynote of the day, and that was Digital Badges and the Future of Learning by Connie Yowell. Um, and she was talking about how, you know, we all talk about wanting to reimagine learning. Um, 
we have to, to do that, we have to solve for three really big things. You're saying a lowered engagement of our students. Um, we have a, a lack of employment skills, so people are coming to uh, the workplace without having the skills that their employers actually need them to have to be uh, helpful. Um, and then there's a lack of equality. So these are all serious issues and they're why we need to reinvent learning. Um, so what uh, she did is find information about going back to asking successful adults um, how they learn and what their learning experiences was. I mean, like, would they have mapped it out as, you know, the career progression of elementary school, middle school, high school, university, that or something else. And so what they found was that learning wasn't a linear path, that it was people learned through a wide variety of connected and networked ways, you know, not just school, but a wide variety of things, uh, some formal, informal, what have you. Um, and so to reimagine learning, we need to capture that kind of learning experience and recognize it, celebrate it. So what she said, one of the solutions for this is, is badges, in particular open badges. And so um, open badges is a standard. It, it's a kind of badge. It carries a lot of data about the person who earns the badge, where they earned it, how they earned it, and connection to um, relevant standards. Um, Ideally, you want these standards to be universally recognizable so that anyone can understand what they mean. Um, open badges are shareable, and that's really important. Uh, as any of you who have ever done really obnoxious training at one job and then moved to another company and had to do that same kind of training again because they didn't, your records didn't come with you, um, having shareable badges that are shareable anywhere is fantastic for avoiding that kind of nonsense. Um, and so then open badges tend to be more like a, a combination transcript portfolio um, that follows you your whole career and documents a wide range of knowledge and learning. So this is a really cool concept. Uh, I think we're starting to see little bits of inroads with that. I mean, like if you go to LinkedIn, you can start seeing certain types of badges on there now and capturing slightly different learning experiences than just, you know, here's where I've worked and where I went to university. And if we can get more of that, and get this to be a universally recognized thing, or at least more universally recognized, uh, it can really change you know, what we see as learning, especially if learning for a career, and how we represent that learning in a way that can be uh, easily understood by anyone. And so that was day one. Um, I really, it's Steph Learn, I love this conference, and I'm super excited about tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm running a session on design, and, um, you know, lots of other really cool stuff. Adam Savage from Mythbusters, that's cool. And, uh, you know, demo fest. So uh, I'm going to head to bed, get some well-earned rest, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.